ever made a way for you, you'd be shouting right now. Has anybody seen him move some mountains? You've seen him get some stuff out of the way just for you? All by yourself, he did it for you. He done it for you. Anybody in the last 30 days he did something for? Hallelujah. Open your mouth and give him a good shout. Just, just shout. <laughs> Glory to God. He still makes a way out of nowhere. <laughs> and I'm a witness. And we are witnesses today. We stand here because the mountains moved. And we didn't move. He moved. Turn to somebody and tell them he a mountain mover today. I've seen you move. believe he can do it again or you don't act like he can do it again oh he can only do it one time how many you know he's done it twice how many know he's done it three times how many know he's able to do it over and over i've seen you move ah. sit down sit down Sit your believing self down. Sit your. Hey, I believe. <laughs> you do it again. Come on, give him a good praise in this house. Oh, that should have made somebody feel good. Hallelujah. <laughs> somebody. 
somebody, he did something for in the last three days. Last three days. Real recent. Just lift up a hand. Anybody believe you're going to see him do it again? Put your hand on your chest. Say, he's going to do it for me. He's going to do it for me. Amen. 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 Come on, you... electronic devices so we can say our Bible confession together. Amen? All right. This is my Bible. I am what it, what it says that I am. This book calls me an overcomer. So that's what I am. Today I shall be taught the infallible, unchanging word of God. So my mind is alert. My heart is receptive as I gladly receive the word today. I believe that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the word that will come from your bountiful table today, God. Anything that is not like you, God, we remove it from the atmosphere right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, you take full control and have free reign. And we thank you on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're celebrating a special day for our shepherd, the 29 years of ministering to this house. So I thought it was befitting that we talk about leadership today. So the title of the lesson is Blueprint of a Leader. Amen? So let's just get a couple of housekeeping things out of the way. Let's define what a blueprint is. A blueprint is a design. It's an outline. It's a sketch, a pattern, or a model. And then a leader we know is a person that has the ability to lead or direct a group of people. And that position can be formal or informal. So I'll talk about that in just a moment. But how do people recognize a leader? The most common way that we recognize a leader is by a title. At work, we recognize a leader as a director, a manager, a supervisor, administrator, chief of staff, or chief of surgery. In the political arena, we recognize leaders as governors and mayors, presidents, dictators, minority leaders, minority whips, and attorney generals. In the Bible, Leaders are recognized as priests, rabbis, Sanhedrin councils, kings, emperors, and even tax collectors. In our church, leaders are, no are noted as pastors, bishops, elders, ministers, popes, deacons, and cardinals, depending on where you come from. So formal leaders are those people who are voted into a position, promoted into a position, some are even born into a position, and others are elevated, and some are called into that position. But informal leaders are not called, and they're not voted, and they're not promoted into a position. There are people who have influence over other people in the respect of, of the group that they are in because they inspire others to move better than what they were before. So those are your informal leaders. 
And they, a lot of times they have just as much authority as formal leaders. In the case of Moses and Joshua, Moses called Joshua out in front of all of the people to transfer, to transfer his authority from him to Joshua. In Deuteronomy 31 and 7, he said, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give to them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. So that was a formal promotion. He formally called him out in front of everyone. So there was no distinction about who was the leader. There was nothing to say, oh, maybe he's the leader, maybe he isn't. They knew distinctly that he was the leader that was anointed by Moses. Other people like Martin Luther King, he wasn't initially called or voted in to be a leader. He was a minister and he was an activist, but he became the leader in the face of the civil rights movement simply because he inspired millions of people to stand up and to fight for equality. So you've got your example of a formal leader and an informal leader. But there are other characteristics that leaders are noted by. But the most common one is by title. We also know the leaders by character. When we look at a leader, we think that they are dedicated, they have wisdom, they have resilience, they're committed, they have discernment, boldness. They're able to navigate the systems very well. They're visionary. They have integrity, composure, accountability. They're trustworthy, and they're able to handle opposition and ridicule. And above all, they have courage. Billy Graham once said that courage is contagious. When a brave man stands up and takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. So if you're around a courageous person, chances are that if you weren't courageous, you will be if you hang around them long enough. So a leader has to be brave in order for their followers to want to follow them and to follow suit. So whatever a leader does, normally the people will follow close behind. And that's how leaders are made. What does the Bible say about leaders? In Hebrews 13 and 7, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their ways of life and imitate their faith. Remember that the, lead, the game called follow the leader. Well, that's what the scripture is saying to you. Watch the leader in front of you. Watch your pastors. If their lives are filled with faith, we should be emulating that same thing. So it's very important. Trust in the Lord and do good and dwell in the land and on all his faithfulness. And God will give you the desires of your heart. I think a lot of leaders, if they're Christian leaders, will stand on that. Why do we need good leaders? Not just any leaders, but good leaders. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, if people cannot see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. If you don't know it this way, you'll know it this way. It says, without a vision, the people will fail. They have to have a leader guiding them. But when things are revealed, my mom used to say, once you know better, you will do better. Leaders show us the way. They are our guides. They are our patterns. People do what's modeled before them. So if the leaders are keeping the law, then we're going to keep the law. We will model the law. We will emulate the law. So now that I have identified what a leader looks like and what a leader, the tools that a leader needs to be an effective leader, let's take a look at a blueprint of a leader in the word of God. So and see if you can identify some of those same characteristics or some of those same titles. So I'll give you a little background because I know I hate to come into a movie and have to ask questions. What happened? And why is this happening? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background before we get to where we're going. The scene is 458 to 450 BC before Christ, and the children of Israel, they are now out of captivity. They're no longer held captive in the land. Some of them have returned to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem and others have been scattered throughout the province and the region. The Babylonian army have attacked Jerusalem and its people numerous of times. 
and the Persian emperor, Arzesius, is now in power, but now he is allowing the Jewish people to return to their land and rebuild Jerusalem. So what would happen is once your land was conquered, they would run you off of that land. You had no right to it. But this king decided to let people to go back to Jerusalem and at least have a place to live. So now that everything was conquered and the Jews were returning to their land, Jerusalem was a desolate city. It was destroyed. The Babylonian armies had torn down the walls. They had burned down the gates. And the city had no protection. So people were living there, but it was like living in squalor. You had no protection from anything. People could come and go, and they can do anything that they decided to do. And Jerusalem laid in this condition for over 120 years. And that's a long time to stay in that kind of state. So Jerusalem was open to more attacks. They were open to their land being plundered. They were open to people extorting them because a lot of the other surrounding nations would come in and actually charge them high tax rates. So most of the Jews felt that they had no city and they felt that they had no place to call their own. So the disposition of, of Jerusalem was disgraceful to the Hebrew nation. Because as you know, the Hebrew nation said that this is our God. Our God is mighty in power. And it was almost as if they had fallen from grace. And other nations mocked the Hebrews. And I imagine they said things like, where's your God now? Who's protecting you now? You guys thought that you were so much with your God. Now look at you. Look at where you are and what you've become. So it was a sore spot and it was a disgrace for the Hebrews to have their cities to, to look as it did. So now enter into the scene a man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a cupbearer for King Arzesius. Now a cupbearer is an important and it's a dangerous position. And it was a position that Nehemiah was privileged to see everything that the king did. He was privileged to see the negotiations and the inner workings of the kingdom. And Nehemiah was also in that position to learn and to observe how things in the kingdom work. He was able to negotiate inner workings if he had to, should it become necessary. So sometimes God will place you in a position or place that does not seem to be quite the right fit. And you get weary and you say, God, why am I here? This is a dead end job. I don't want to stay here. But you never know what God's preparing you for. Your job is to do the best job that you can do. Your job is to observe and to learn. Yeah. Because you never know what he's preparing you for. Yeah. Nehemiah was responsible for tasting the king's food, for drinking the king's wine, because there was always someone looking to overthrow a kingdom or a king. Yeah. Yeah. And their weapon of choice was for assassination was poison. Yeah. That was the easiest thing for you to do. And for all of your game, a throne fans. If you remember the wedding reception of King Jeffrey, Littlefinger did not taste the cup before he handed it over to the king, and the king drank it, and he died. He was poisoned right there at his own wedding reception. So Nehemiah had quite the dangerous job, and one that placed himself in harm's way every single day, but he did it for the sake of the king. He was also in a trusted position, because the king trusted Nehemiah that he would not let something happen to him. So this is where the story picks up. We want to go to Nehemiah 1, and we want to take a look at it. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakala, it came to pass in the month of Kisla, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, the Hanai, one of the brethren came with men from Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived captivity, and, who, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity are in the province, and they are in great distress and reapproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and their gates are burned with fire. So this tells the story. The news of Jerusalem and the condition saddened Nehemiah greatly. And it burdened him because he was so taken by what had happened to the Jews. Nehemiah knew that something needed to be done, 
but he wasn't quite sure what had to be done. So let's look at verse 4. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. And I, and, I, sorry, and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. This fast and this prayer of Nehemiah's lasted for four long months. Sometimes when God answers prayer, he doesn't answer prayer right away for you. He doesn't give you an immediate answer. And when he does give you an answer, it may be in bits and pieces. So this lasted for four months that Nehemiah mourned, and he wept before the Lord. God always will give you an answer when you place a petition for him. You just have to be patient and to hear and to wait and hear what the Lord has to say. So during this time, God gave Nehemiah a vision first and a plan second. It may have been months in between. Maybe he told him this is what needs to happen, and it could have been several months before he really got the plan and how to do it. But God gave Nehemiah the plan to be, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So now Nehemiah went from a cupbearer to a visionary. That's the first thing in a leader. The scripture that comes to mind is that the steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. Four months is a long time to think about something and to worry about something. And then God had to give Nehemiah that vision first. And that means that there was a process that he had to take Nehemiah through. So we have to be patient for the process because things are done in increments and not all at once. A leader must be able to see what is and then pair it with reality of, of what it really is. So we have to live in the future but be in the present at the same time. That's exhausting for a leader. When you're in the habit of praying every day, about every situation and every encounter that you have, God will supply his presence for you, no matter what. But we have to get in the habit of doing that. The word says, behold, I am with you always, even until the end of time. So every morning when you wake up, you should be inviting God into your day to take full control over your day because we are powerless without him. Whenever I have a problem that seems to be impossible, I take it to God, especially when I'm at work. I might go in the bathroom and I start praying about it. I'm walking during lunchtime and praying about it. I'm praying about it on my way home, sitting in the car by myself. But undoubtedly, every single time when I go to sleep, the answer comes to me in my sleep. I get up and write it down. And this has happened over and over and over and over again. So God proves himself. And that's something that we should not take lightly. If we know that it works, keep doing it. Why are you fretting? If you got a problem, take it to God in prayer. He will work it out for you. So in prayer, Nehemiah repented for the sins of himself, his fathers. He interceded on behalf of the children of Israel for their disobedience. So remember, when they were in captivity, they complained. God delivered them from captivity into a promised land. But what did they do? They didn't honor God. They married this person, that person. They took on the cultures that they knew were, that was not right. They were worshiping idol gods. They did anything that they were big enough and bad enough to do. And they forgot the promises of God. So Nehemiah intercessed for them on their behalf because he believed the promises of God and that they would come true. So Nehemiah could see both the problem and the solution, even though he had never, ever been to Jerusalem. Think about that for a minute. Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem, but yet in his mind, he can see the condition of Jerusalem, and he had formulated a plan on how to fix that problem. Why? Because God was in the plan. God gave it to him. So leaders can see further than others can see. They can see more than others can see. They can see the problem and the solution before anybody else can. That is a leader, and that is inborn, and that's given by God. So the story continues. Now that we know the problem, now that we know the plan, the second thing for Nehemiah to do is to put this plan in motion. Well, he's just a cupbearer. How does he do that? It takes money, and it takes resources. So the next question becomes, how do you approach people of influence? 
This is what a leader does. <laughs> Nehemiah knew the best time to approach the king because he's right there. He's the king, right hand's man. He knows what's going on. And he's accustomed to the atmosphere in the kingdom. So one day, while he was placing wine before the king, the king's wife was there. He looked sad. His countenance was sad because he was carrying this burden along with him. And the king inquired and said, why are you looking sad? I know you're not sick. What is it? And you know, and sometimes when we don't know what to say and we're caught off guard, we say crazy things, right? <laughs> Nehemiah blurted out, may the king live forever. <laughs> what kind of answer was that? Then he prayed to himself, oh, Lord, give me the boldness to stand up. He, could, he regained his composure, and he began to tell the king of the plight of the Jerusalem walls. But the way he did it was kind of slick. He's appealed to the king's sense of having a legacy. So he told the king, my father's tombs are in ruin. The gates are broken down. The place of my ancestors are, is all torn down. And the king said, but well, what do you want me to do about it? And Nehemiah told him, I want you to send me to Judea, to Judea so that I may fix my father's tomb in the place of my ancestors. So the king thought about it, and his wife chimed in, well, how long are you going to be? Nehemiah didn't have an answer right away for that, but I'm sure at some point he gave them an answer. So Nehemiah says, if it pleases the king, and if I find favor in your sight, then please send me to Judea so that I can rebuild it. So the king thought about it, and he's thought about it for a while, and he says, okay, I'll send you. So here comes that old saying, it's get while the getting is good and strike while the iron is hot. <laughs> Nehemiah said, you know, king, I need letters that will allow me to travel throughout the region so that the governors will give me safe passage through their land. Yeah. The king obliged him. He said, okay. He says, and then I also need letters to the king's um, forest keeper yeah so that I can get timber to rebuild the gates and to rebuild the temple walls and a house for myself, which means that Nehemiah was going to be there for a while. <laughs> so Nehemiah had actually found favor with um, the king because the king threw in some extras for him in the form of captains from the army, horsemen that went along with Nehemiah because it was a dangerous journey. And it wasn't good for you to be traveling by yourself because someone would take advantage of you. So Nehemiah truly found favor in the eye of the king. God is always working on our behalf behind the scene. And we say that because God sets up circumstances and he sets up things for the leaders to give us favor. And the reason for that is that God influences the influencer. He has control. God has the heart's king in his hand had the heart of the king in his hand. So that influencer was all done behind the scenes, and Nehemiah didn't know it. It was just in timing, because leaders know timing. So now we arrive in Jerusalem, and the way Nehemiah came in allowed him to view the walls of the cities from two angles, so he could survey the city. When he got to the city, he didn't tell anybody that he was there, and he didn't tell them the reason that he was there. But at night, what he did is he moved around the city, looking at the walls on either side, looking at the gates. He wanted to see firsthand what the damage was so that he can plan out the project. And he didn't tell others what he was doing because he didn't need anybody else's input because God had already given him the plan. He just needed to see it firsthand on his own. So then once he surveyed the land, he came up with the project. Then Nehemiah met with the priest, and he met with the nobles, the officials, and the Jews. And he had to encourage them and to remind them that God has brought you from here to there. Yeah. There are things that he has done for you that you can't forget. Yeah. So why can't he do this for us? So the third thing, the point number three, Nehemiah had to cast a vision with the people. And that's what leaders do. They have to cast a vision that God has given them. So a leader must have buy-in from the people. So let's go to chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, and see what happened with that. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in. He made himself a part of it. He said, we, not you. And how Jerusalem 
has wasted away and the gates were burned with fire. Come and let us build the walls of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon them, and also the king's word that had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. So he did have the, he had the buy-in of the people. They were willing to do this because they believed in it. Point number four, a leader must be able to organize people and prioritize projects in order to get things done. He had to use his resources of money, his resources of influence, and people are a source of resources. He had to put the right man with the right job in the right place. So Nehemiah organized families according in groups according to their natural skills and their interests. He had families rebuilding the gates and the fence or the, the wall that was directly in front of their homes. Because not only did it protect the city, it was protecting their homes. If you were a construction worker, he had you work in construction. If you could build, if you could build gates and walls, whatever your talent was, this is where Nehemiah placed you to get the best result. Number five, a leader must be able, able to see opposition and dangers. If we go over to chapter four, we know that nothing goes unchallenged and there are always naysayers and it's always somebody who said that you can't do anything. Well, there was a trio in this scene that did not want the wall to be built and they opposed the wall. Their name was Sam Bollett. He was the Hornonite, and he was the ringleader of this whole thing. Tobiah, the Ammonite, he was an official, and Goshen, the Arab. So what they decided to do, since they did not want this wall built, they decided to just try to insult the people, to try to interrupt their work. The, their job was mainly to soar discord and disruption. Because if you know you can get into the midst of people and stir up trouble, people stop working. They, they lose focus. They lose sight. So they want to end fighting. And we see that today in our political system. And it's very easy to identify. My grandmother used to say, you throw a rock and hide your hands. This is what they were doing because they wanted the people to fight among themselves. But when the insults didn't work, they wanted to escalate it. So they had to do something different. This time, they sent letters to Nehemiah, three or four letters, asking him to come out and to meet with him. Leaders have to be discerning. Nehemiah knew they had no intentions of meeting. There was no compromise to be had. This project had to go on. He ignored the letters. But the true deception behind these letters was they wanted to lure him out and to kill him. So he knew this. And Nehemiah said, they're not going to get me there. He simply ignored the letters that they were sending. Yeah. So now they want to escalate a little further. They decided to use fear and entrapment and political movements um, to try to disturb the people. And their weapons of choice, was, or their, they wanted to just stop the work. That's what they had in mind. There are no new tricks. We see those tricks today. Yeah. Those are tricks existed long ago. It sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Yeah. A leader must have a plan to handle the danger and the opposition. Now listen to this. The Hornonites lived on the north side of Jerusalem. That was Sandoval. The Arabs lived on the south side of Jerusalem. That was Goshen. The Ammonites were on the east side of Jerusalem. That was Tobiah. And the Ashdodites were on the west side of Jerusalem. They were surrounded. And Pastor Marcy sung that song today. Oh, Lord, how many have increased against me. Many of they who rise up against me. But thou, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. The glory and the lifter of my head. When I heard that, I almost jumped out of my skin. <laughs> then I thought about Michael W. Um, Smith has a song that says, I'm sur looks like I'm surrounded, but I'm not surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battle. Yeah. So the, the, the thing here is that when you feel like you're surrounded, find a song. Yeah. Find a song of worship. Hang on to it. Because then that you build up yourself. You encourage yourself. You remind yourself that it's not just you, but it's you and God. And God is your protection. So this is what happened with them. 
And then, you know, we think about that. God, he's the shield. Yes. Nehemiah went back to the people. He reminded them of this. And he said, well, here's why they don't want the wall to be built. And if you know like I know, if you follow the money, you'll find out why. Yeah. Yeah. The repair of the wall meant that the Jews could no longer de defend themselves. They were open to every which kind of thing that could happen to them. The repair of the wall would bring a shift in commerce and political power. And Sanballat liked things the way that they were. It was lucrative for him. So remember, he's the lean reader, leader, but he's getting all these other people to participate to do his dirty work. But it was all to benefit him because he was the main person that was pilfering the children of Israel in Jerusalem. So the fix will go to chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Therefore, this is what Nehemiah did. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower part of the wall at the opening, and I set the people according to their families with swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked in our rows and said to the nobles and to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and will fight. And I want you to fight for your brethren, for your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And the first three words of the next verse said, and it happened. Yeah. So this is how he prepared them. Yeah. So moving forward, they kept working both day and night. Half of them worked, half of them was protecting. Nehemiah was standing afar with the trumpet, and that trumpet was their alert system back in that day. He could see anything that was happening. And so the trumpet player stood next to Nehemiah. So half of the people worked, half of the people had weapons and was on the lookout. There were other people who simply carried their weapons on their side just in case so that they could still work. This wall had been down for 120 years. So you can imagine the rubble and the, and the decimation that this wall was in. But they rebuild the wall in 52 days. Imagine that, 52 days. This city was taken from ruins back to where it could be. This is what people can do when they work together, when they stay focused, when they do not allow outside influences to get them distracted. They can move mountains if they had to. We just sang this song. I know he can do it. He moved the mountain, and I know that he can do it. So they were no longer open to the approach of the enemy. They were, no long, they were protected, and they could defend themselves. So although this story talked about Nehemiah and his skills as a leader, that was only half of the story. We won't go into the other part of the story. But people working together can bring about a change. It shows how God's resources are limitless. Because if you don't ask, you don't have. Everybody knows that. So the walls also represents a spiritual side. It represented for the children of Israel God's strength and God's protection. So there was a natural side of, of safety and protection, and there was a spiritual side to this as well. And God always shows us both sides if you look forward. So Nehemiah now has rebuilt the walls, but the city was still a mess. The rest of his job was he had to restore the Jewish people to their rightful places. He had to reteach the laws that Moses had taught because they had simply forgotten it. He was in Jerusalem for 12 long years, 12 long years, that it took him to accomplish this and to reestablish that nation. But then after 12 years, he returned back to his king who was still in power. He stayed for a while, and then he went back again. So now that you know the story, can you identify the leadership skills that Nehemiah had? Can you see that he was a visionary? Can you see the tools that he used as a leader? He was dedicated. He was discerning. He had courage. He navigated situations. He had bold, bold, uh, boldness, wisdom, and, compulsion, and um, composure. And I want you to also know that you draw a parallel to our growth track classes. Every Sunday, those classes are held here. And they're designed to give us the vision of the church. That's the first one. And then it takes you through a series to find out where your giftings are and where your talents are and where your interests are. And then you're assigned to a position. 
something that's natural to you, something that you're interested in, but it works to achieve the vision of this house. So anyone that comes in this house, you have no right to sit down because you have a gift, you have a talent, and then we become the hands and the feet of the visionary of this house. So we all have a job to do. Everybody has a job to do. We know that our pastor is a visionary. We know that he has the vision of this house. How can we not help him with that? We have to be able to do that. He is our leader, and we love him for that. So let us be like the children of Israel. Let us say, let us rise up and build together. God bless you. Absolutely awesome, Cher. I like how you just walk through the word with that thing. Absolutely awesome. I, uh, but a few things stick out. How many of you got a lot of nuggets of stuff? How many of you preachers stole some stuff? I'm, I'm, I'm like my bishop. He, he says, he listens to, 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 to gain information like that. But she said some things that, that were, were, were key and, and that, that, that hit my heart a special way. It took 52 weeks to build the wall, but 12 years to get the people together. Then she said about how You need influence with influencers. That was a powerful word. Sometimes you just need to be praying, put me next to the right influence. Anybody got any stories where you just happened to be at the right place at the right time? And the person you talked to was influential enough to make something happen. That's a God moment. And I think that's how it's done in the kingdom of God. As we are in the world, we need favor. We need favor with influencers. And, and let me be clear. We think everybody needs to like us. was to cut Barry to outer Xerxes. He was, he, 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 he had a little bit of favor. But he was still a servant. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so because of his closeness with the influence, he just decided I'm going to influence something. But I thank God for the influence. The influence of protection and the influence of reestablishing the word among the people of God. And so thank you, Sherry, for that. Give her another big hand. That was awesome. And some of us are missing today, but we have a blueprint in this house. Amen. And we thank God for it. Thank him that it's worthy of following. It's worthy of, of, of moving into. And so with that, if you are in this house and you're not connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, you haven't made him your Lord and Savior, it's available to you today. All you have to do is invite him in. It's real easy. The word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. He wants you saved. I'm going to do all the calls at one time. That was the call for salvation. The next call is if you've been away from church for a while and you need to be connected, you need to go where the Spirit hearkens you to go. And I know we go to a lot of churches for a lot of different reasons, but you need to go where you're sent. 
and where you feel the spirit of the Lord beckoning you, this is where you need to be. Because maybe there just might be a wall that you need to be built in front of your house in that place. How many of you know God knows where to position you? To help the kingdom and then to help your family too. I love that piece. So if you need to be restored back to the kingdom of God, to the house of God, it's available to you. We love you. The third call is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday is what is what considered Pentecost Sunday. And that Sunday, we're really praying for people to get filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, it's not Pentecostal. Pentecostal means sent. It means filled. It means evangelistic. It's not a denomination. We made it one. It's not charismatic or non-charismatic. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's everybody. It happened with 120 folk in the upper room and, and, and Peter preached his sermon and 3,000 souls were added. There's not many people, many preachers that can say they preach one time and 3,000 souls were added. And they were all filled. It's available to you today. So here they are again to be saved, to be restored back to kingdom, join the church, and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're in this room and you'd like to respond to one of those, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to ask you to say anything because that's not what we do. But we just want to acknowledge your hand, pray for you, and have counselors talk to you about the decision, whichever one you decided after this service, because we love you. And we believe the word that was preached. We believe the praise and worship that went out in this house. We believe that the presence of the Lord is in this place. We believe that. And we believe that he's a way maker. And he still does miracles. We are a miracle. So if you want to respond to number one salvation, two to be restored back to the kingdom of God, Become a part of the household of faith, church. Or three, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Any one of those. Just slip up a hand. Say, that's me, Pastor. Come on. Somebody needs to come back. Somebody needs to do that. It's not about who you sit next to or who you brought with you. It's an individual walk with the Lord while the saints are praying for you. I'm talking to somebody in this house. Make that kind of decision. I'm talking to you today. It's available to you. Come on. Don't be afraid. Just lift up your hand and we're going to pray for you and believe for your life. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Well, you have it. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a great praise in this house. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord is good to us. How many of you know he's good?